We are now live. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, members, and welcome to this Pension Sub and Pensions uh, Board Joint uh, Committee meeting on Wednesday, 8th of December 2021 at 10.30. Um, this meeting has been recorded and live streamed. Could I remind members to follow the good practice guiding, which include muting microphones and switching off their video when you're not addressing the meeting. Should you wish to contribute to any items, you should speak in the Teams chat function or raise your virtual hand and you will be invited to speak in order. Should your question or issue be raised by a previous speaker, please withdraw your request so that we deal with the business as efficiently as possible. We we'll go on to item one. Uh, Say that apologies and chair's approval of members' remote participation for pension subcommittee. Tracy, any said that apologies? Thank you, Chair. Morning, members. We've got seven members present, six on Microsoft Teams, and one present in sorry, two present in uh, Council Chambers HQ, being Councillor Thompson and Councillor Scobie. And apologies from Vice Chair Councillor Campbell and Councillor Charteris. Not present is Councillor McClelland and Councillor Wilson. Okay, thank you very much. And if, if those members in the hall wish to speak, you'll keep his right, Tracy. Yeah. Um, so the next item is said on apologies and chairs approval of mem members' remote participation for the pension board. Tracy. Next chair, uh, we've got five members currently present from the board. Not present is uh, Jan Andrews and Phil McGrogan. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest for pension subcommittee? Jeannie, thank you. Are there any declarations of interest uh, for the Pensions Board? Okay. Thank you very much. Then we'll go into item number five, which is the Investment Strategy Review Report by Head of Finance and Procurement. This report provides members with an update from Hyman Robertson, the Pension Fund's Investment Advisors, on the work carried out to date on behalf of the fund with the Investment Strategy Review. Ian Campbell from Hyamans is here to take members through a presentation and discuss the next steps in more detail. But before we get that, Paul, have you got anything to add to the report? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, just to really to kind of highlight that this is uh, probably one of the most significant uh, items that the committee uh, gets to consider. Uh, it's reflected in the paper. Uh, it's good practice for there to be regular review of the fund's overall investment strategy, and that's generally done aligned with the, the triennial uh, valuation of the funds. So I set out in the report that there's kind of two key stages to that review. The first is that, that kind of high level split of our assets between kind of three broad categories. That's uh, growth or return seeking assets, there's income generating assets, and there's protection assets. Uh, the second part, which we're not covering today, is the more kind of detailed consideration of the specific asset classes within those categories and the managers that will deliver uh, those products. But the kind of key initial consideration is that a high level split of the assets between those three categories. Now, th there is a recommendation in the paper uh, for, for members to consider today. Obviously, in, in order to consider that, it's important the members can have a full understanding of, of what is being suggested. So uh, the recommendation has been informed by detailed analysis and advice provided through Hyman Robertson, as you said. Uh, so before kind of members are asked to consider the, the kind of recommendations of the report, if we could bring Ian in and if you could go through the, the kind of presentation and the findings of the, the review that's been undertaken. Thanks very much, Paul. Good morning, Ian. How are you today? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. If you would just like to give us your no um, presentation. No problem. I will just share my screen for everyone. OK, hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, so just as a quick reminder, at the last committee meeting, I um, gave a quick bit of training on investment strategy, what it is, why it's important, and then the work we, we would be doing to analyse and review your current investment strategy against some potential alternatives. Um, as Paul said, it's good practice that we regularly review it, make sure it's always up to scratch and the best investment strategy we can be implementing. 
Um, and so today we have the results of that analysis. Um, so I'll be I'll be taking you through those with a recommendation, as, as Paul noted. So just as a quick reminder on what investment strategy is, um, as Paul said, it is the high level allocations to growth, income and protection assets. Um, and they are really driven and taking into account the um, the current position of the fund. So in terms of your current funding level, what contribution rates you're receiving and really your risk appetite and risk tolerance. And all of those come together to inform what should we be allocating to these three different categories of investments. It's often cited as the most important investment decision you can make. Um, your strategic asset allocation is often cited to generate 80 to 90 percent of your long term returns, which is why we put so much emphasis on reviewing this and, and make sure it's always backed by detailed analysis. Um, and so with this, we have reviewed your current strategy just to just to check if there's any obvious changes we should be making to make it more suitable going forward. So as Paul said, there's two stages to this. There's the review of the strategy, which is the high level allocation to growth income protection assets. And then after that, the next step is the review of what we call your investment structure. So those are the actual asset classes that you would allocate to that sit within these high level three categories. So within growth, how much to equities, how much to alternatives, within protection, how much to corporate bonds, how much to government bonds. So they would be the next steps that we would be looking at probably in the in the next committee meeting. Right now, the focus today is on the investment strategy piece. So just as a, a reminder, the fund's current investment strategy, you have a target allocation of 62% to growth assets. So these are higher risk, higher return assets. These are your equities in your diversified growth fund. You have 23% target allocation to income assets, so property, BlackRock, uh, Strategic Alternative Income Funds, and the Legal and General Emerging Market Debt Fund. Um, so these are there to produce still strong returns, not as high as growth, but to do so in a way that's also very diversified to growth assets to help bring the overall risk of the portfolio down. And often they pay you returns in forms of cash flows or income, which can help to pay pensioners and the benefits as they fall due. And then finally, protection. So these are essentially defensive assets that are there to help protect the funding level, protect the deficit, particularly in times of severe market volatility, when maybe equity markets are falling significantly, these should protect the value of the fund. So we've monitored your current investment strategy um, against four potential alternatives. So all of these you might notice are reductions in growth assets, which is what this green icon is here. Um, we haven't considered any increases in growth assets, and that's because the fund currently sits at 62% in growth, which is which is quite large. Um, whilst equities are a very good thing to invest in over the long term, they do tend to be pretty volatile over the short term, as recent years have definitely proven. Um, and so what we don't want to do is be allocating too much to these types of assets as, as has happened. You can get big market falls right before an actuarial valuation and, and that ends up needing to, uh, to increase contribution rates. So what we can do is try to reduce that over time when it's affordable um, to help manage the volatility of the fund, make it more sustainable. So we've considered four different strategies. The first two show an increase in income assets of 10 and 20%, and the bottom two show an increase in protection assets of 10 and 20%. Now, I took you through this in uh, the last committee meeting, but just as a reminder, this is how we run your investment strategy. This is how we look at it, how we analyze it. And these are the results that we take out of the analysis to check which strategies might look better or worse. So each of the investment strategies we consider, we run through our model, which runs each strategy 5,000 different times. So it takes into account the expected returns of the different asset classes, but also the volatility of them and how well or, or poorly correlated they might be with each other. And then it randomly generates returns over 5,000 different scenarios over a certain time frame. And then these will range from very, very good outcomes to very, very bad outcomes. And then the middle outcome is what the, we call the median or the average outcome. That's the expected 
outcome. So then we use from this two key metrics to test whether a strategy is suitable or not. So the first metric is probability of success, which is the pink diamond on this slide, which tells you how likely we think a potential investment strategy is to be mean that your fund is 100% funded at some target date in the future. And that's shown by of these 5,000 scenarios that have run, how many of them have at the target date a funding level of 100% or more. So in this particular case on the slide, 3,300 of them were of 100% or higher. And so that's a 66% likelihood of success. That's what we call it. We also need to look at the potential risk of the portfolio or the different investment strategies. So by doing that, we look at, of all these 5,000 scenarios, we look at the 5% of the worst outcomes, so the 5% lowest funding levels when things go particularly badly. And from that, we look at, well, how much could the funding level fall by under these particularly bad scenarios? So, of course, a higher risk investment strategy would have a higher risk measure here because under the bad circumstances, you accept the funding level to, to fall by a lot more. So what does this mean for your current strategy? Um, we believe that you currently have a probability of success of 65.5%. So that means 65.5% chance of being 100% funded in 20 years time or more. Um, and you have a downside risk measure that your funding level in the particularly bad scenarios might fall over the next five years by around 30%. So what would we want from a potential invest new investment strategy? What would really mean that we should go about the work of changing it? We'd want to ideally reduce that risk measure. We want the funding level to fall by less. Um, and we would want to maintain or maybe improve this uh, likelihood of success measure. So on this next slide, we run these four investment strategies against your current investment strategy on these key metrics. Now, apologies, the scales I've used on this chart of zero to 100% mean that the differences between the strategies aren't obvious. With hindsight, I should have used smaller scales on this, but um, I can provide a bit more detail on this. So on the left, you have the current investment strategy, which are the statistics that I previously have just shown you. And then strategy number one, this is your this is the switch of 10% of assets from growth to income so what does this do for these risk and return metrics so your probability of success is broadly the same as your current strategy it's ever so slightly higher um but your risk measure shown by the blue bar is reduced now as i said this scale shows that it, it doesn't look that different on this scale but i can tell you that's a 10% reduction in your risk measure so what this is saying is you can maintain your upside potential, your probability of success, but reduce your risk by 10%. So that's essentially a more efficient portfolio. So that to me was an obvious one here where this is potential to improve the current investment strategy. Now, what's driving this? Essentially, this is taking money out of equities and putting it into these income assets. So this is doing two things. One, you're obviously reducing risk by taking money out of equities. They tend to be the riskiest investments you can make. And so that's, of course, going to reduce the risk somewhat. But it's also going to reduce your return because they tend to be the highest returning assets. But what you're seeing here is a real diversification benefit. So you're increasing the diversification of your investment strategy here, which means that Yes, you're reducing your return slightly, but you're reducing the risk by more. So your prob probability of success remains, but your risk is reduced. OK, the next strategy, number two, is your 20 percent switch from growth to income. So what we can see here is, yes, the risk continues to reduce, but actually the probability of su success reduces as well. And this is because the diversification benefit of an initial this extra 10% into income on top of strategy one isn't as strong. So the risk reduction is still there, but you, ultimately you are allocating maybe too much to these lower returning assets. So the diversification benefit isn't counteracting the reduction in return. So to me, yes, the, the risk is reduced, but your probability of success is reduced as well. So to me, I think strategy one definitely looks more attractive. Strategies three and four are reductions in growth to invest in protection assets. 
So these are investments in corporate bonds and index linked gilts. So currently these investments look pretty, pretty unattractive. They offer you really low or negative returns and they can be pretty volatile as well. So traditionally they've always been used as defensive assets because they've tended to be pretty low volatility, low risk, but right now in current market conditions, this isn't the case. So allocating 10 or 20% significantly reduces your return and it doesn't reduce your risk by quite enough. So you can see these blue bars do reduce compared to the current investment strategy, but actually they reduce by less than allocating to income assets. And that's because these protection assets right now are so unattractive. So to me, three and four were obvious candidates to, to throw out and not consider. To me, across these five strategies, including the current strategy, the most attractive uh, and obvious one to adopt was strategy number one, the 10% move from growth into income. And this slide just summarizes what I've what I've just said there. So what are our recommendations here? So based on the analysis, we believe that you should move 10% of the fund's assets from growth into income assets. This has the benefits of increasing diversification of the investment strategy. It reduces the equity risk of your investment strategy, which in turn reduces the overall investment risk and your funding level risk. And it maintains returns at a reasonable level and does not reduce the likelihood that you will be fully funded in 20 years time. Moving more than 10% of assets into income does not have quite a stronger benefit for the fund and moving money into, into protection assets just is, 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 not, is not attractive enough for the fund, which is why we're recommending this 10% switch to income. So what does that do to your target investment strategy? So we move from the pie chart on the left, the current strategy of 62% in growth and 23 in income into the right pie chart, 52% in growth, 33% in income. So this is starting to look like a bit more of a balanced investment strategy here. So what are the next steps? Um, so if you agree with this recommendation, we can begin work on a more detailed implementation of these growth income and protection allocations, as, as Paul mentioned before. We can start to look at the structure of this investment strategy. Because, of course, we need to ask if we're going to be taking money out of growth and into income, where are we taking that money from? Where are we putting it into? And this gives us an opportunity to review the investment structure from a, a wider perspective as well. So this can cover things such as what should your equity portfolio look like? What should your property portfolio look like? How much are you happy to invest in illiquid assets? Um, are there more attractive assets we can invest in in the protection section? And of course, given that we are potentially going to be setting some response from investment beliefs, how do we implement those across this investment structure as well? So that was the end of my presentation and I will open up to any questions. Thanks, thanks very much Ian for that, that presentation. Um, members, it's over to you for any questions. Um, I've I've got one, Ian. So I mean, obviously, um, you've you've put five thousand scenarios into place here, and, and looking at the best probable outcome, mm -hmm. every investment, of course, has a has a risk. Um, but the the um, you know, I, I'm looking at benchmarking here. How how you know how many times do you benchmark, for instance, other pension schemes? And and ninety two percent is actually you know not as far as I'm it's a sort of average, not bad setup. At the moment, if you're above 100%, sometimes there's issues with that as well. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you, if you've done any sort of benchmarking, and obviously 5,000 scenarios is, is, is scenarios as opposed to benchmarking uh -huh. or pension um, schemes. Oh, so, sorry, so do you, is the question, do we compare you to other LGPS investment strategies? Yes, okay. Um, so to some extent, yes, but ultimately what we want to do is set what the correct investment strategy is for you and your fund um, and your particular circumstances. Um, so of course, your particular contribution rates, your funding level are what drive, how much return we need, how much risk we need to take. Um, but of course, what we wouldn't want to do is that have you having a, investment strategy that's completely out of line with everyone else because that would suggest that maybe we're doing something a little bit wrong so absolutely 
we do make sure that we compare investment strategies of our clients internally, make sure there's no bizarre outliers. And if there are, ask why that is. Um, and of course, when setting this investment strategy, I make sure it's peer reviewed by a number of different consultants, including David Walker, our CIO, um, who's made sure that this is all up to scratch and looks correct. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Thompson, Stephen, welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, it's just, um, I'm actually looking at the reliances and limitations on page 26 onwards in the presentation. And obviously, I mean, it is important that we review our strategy and, and consider the reallocations, as, you, as you've touched on. Um, but what we seem to be assuming is that um, basically, you know, on the back of like a high profile COP26 and transition to a green economy or, or, or just transition or whatever it's been called, uh, not just in the UK, but globally, we're sort of saying, yeah, 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 but um, basically things are going to stay the same pretty much, apart from we think interest rates will rise gradually. I don't know if that's in the UK or globally. Um, so kind of business as usual, more or less. So I, I'm trying to square that off because we're going to come on to that in the next paper, you know, just in terms of our values, if you like, and what we're assuming. Um, so uh, that seems to be saying the way we've modelled this to get these um, 5,000 outcomes is assuming a lot of things will stay the same. And that also includes on page 27, um, the assumption that basically the, 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 the paying into the fund will stay pretty much the same as well, which kind of also implies that the council budget, which is basically paying staff, will stay the same over time. Now, a lot of people politically will argue, <laughs> argue whether or not that'd be the case. So, but that's kind of, I don't know if that's quite a courageous assumption to make or not. So. Are we sure our assumptions are solid, would be my first question. Thank you. You're, uh, you're absolutely right that we should be considering these things. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is try and predict the future, which is a very difficult thing to do. And it's also why we make sure that we readdress this every three years to take into account things that may change and have changed. So if we have better information in three years' time, that would then be factored into a new review. Um, in terms of COP, I don't know if there was anything obvious coming out of that that would that would drive our different allocations to growth, income and protection. When we factor responsible investment into the funds, that will come in in the investment structure piece, where we would pick on the the types of mandates that we would allocate to, whether we wanted to factor things like climate change or wider ESG in. Um, and then in terms of the council budget, again, that's, that's something that in three years' time, when we review this again, if that's looking like a not so clever assumption, that's something that we would definitely change and that would definitely come out of your um, actuarial valuation as well. If it's okay, just to quickly come back, uh, Chair. Um, yep. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So and, and I'm just sort of thinking, well, in three years, I mean, we, it's taken maybe, it feels like three years to actually um, fully invest in our Black Rock uh, wow. because of the because the variation in liquidity between things might say, well, actually, ev every three years, you might not have the time to shift the balance as easily as you think because it's not that liquid. So, uh, you know, how, and it costs money to do it as well. So, um, So is that a factor also? Yes, so the costs of uh, changing the investment strategy are definitely factored in here. We need these um, statistics that come out of the investment strategy to look attractive enough compared to the current strategy to warrant the costs of changing the investment strategy. Um, I'm sorry, I've just forgotten your first question. Uh, mainly around the, the example of the Black Rock, I think. Yes, yes. Sorry. Um, yes, you're right. So in the considerations as well, which I should have mentioned of do we shift 10 or 20 percent into income? One of the them is the practicalities of implementing this. So 10 percent switch is a lot more implementable than 20 percent, given a lot of these income assets are quite a liquid and it can take a long time to get them invested. Um, so that's part of what's come in there. And then when we look at the investment structure, um, had a quick discussion of this with with Paul and Ross, we would definitely be looking at the liquidity of any potential new investments we would make. How liquid do we want them to be and how quickly do we want to make sure we can get that money invested in them? Because you're right, we don't want to every three years be having to play catch up on the last investment strategy. 
um, if we're still having to try and implement that. So you're absolutely right. And in the structure of you, we will be considering how implementable a new investment strategy would be. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Malcolm, you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Actually, uh, Stephen's basically just asked what I, what I was going to go to ask. You know, 10% is quite a, a sizable amount to move. And, I, and again, I was going to bring, bring up the black roll thing, so it's basically been answered. I was concerned about the, the length of time this was going to take. That was, uh, that was, that was basically my concern. Okay, thanks, Malcolm. Uh, Jim, you want to come in? Thanks, Archie. Ian, given the comments you've made about the volatility of bond markets, mm -hmm. how accurate a description is the word protection? It's a very, very good question. Um, so that's definitely something we would be considering in the structure review. So what are the point of protection assets? As I mentioned before, they're there to protect the funding level, to protect a deficit. They're there to be low risk investments, defensive protective assets. We're investing in things that are pretty volatile, especially index link gilts. Um, they fluctuate significantly, particularly at the minute, given the, the highly uncertain situation regarding inflation and interest rates. So whether they still are fit for purpose as a protection asset, you're exactly right to ask. And in the structure review, I think as I noted here, this bullet point, options protection assets, are there potential different types of bonds we can be investing in here to help get a bit better protection, something that's more suited to this, this word protection, as you say. Exactly right. Thank you. Happy with that, Jim? Yes, indeed, actually. I well, can't see anybody else willing to come in. Oh, sorry, who's this? Uh, are you putting your hand up again, Jim, or is it just... No, I'm trying to... <laughs> Try to get it done. Right. Uh, we'll go to the recommendations then. Um, first of all, we've asked to note the contents of the presentation investment strategy model modelling results by Hyman Robertson in the appendix and on, on the screen. At 2.2, agree the change in investment strategy from the current allocation to a reduction in the gross seeking allocation of 10% of fund assets to fund an increase in income generating assets, option one, as detailed in paragraph 4.7 of this report. And 2.3, agree to receive a report on detailed asset allocation at the March 2022 um, meeting of this subcommittee and board. Members happy with the recommendations? That's agreed then. Thank you very much. OK, we'll go on to um, the next item, which is responsible investments, the next steps. And all members were given the opportunity to take part in a responsible investment uh, belief survey following the September meeting of this committee. Hyman Robertson have used their response to produce the presentation appended to this report. Um, and before Ian takes us through the presentation, Paul, have you got anything to add? I believe there's, there was a, a you know a reasonable return from members of both the board and and the subcommittee. There was thanks, Chair. Chair, can I ask? Apologies. Uh, <clears throat> I hope I'm not doing anything wrong from a government's perspective here, but I just wanted to add. I don't think it affects your, your discuss, discussion at all or decision in the last item. But I just wanted to add a piece of kind of additional information, if that's okay. And that's there was mention a couple of times of potentially moving to different specific types of investment as part of the next stage of the investment strategy review. And I really just wanted to kind of stress to members that prior to members being asked to take decisions in relation to that more detailed asset allocation, we'll be making sure that we arrange appropriate training to allow members to get a, a good grasp and understanding and a degree of assurance on those asset classes before we'll be asking to take decisions. So apologies, I apologize I tried to come in just at the end of the, before you got to the recommendations, Chair, but I just wanted to add that piece of information for members' assurance if that's okay. I, th I think that's assured us that we will get that training, Paul, moving forward and slap wrist for no, give me a shout. No, uh, sir, my, 100% my fault. Apologies for that. Uh, just in terms of uh, the Responsible Investments report, just to, to kind of highlight that obviously this subcommittee has taken measures over the recent period to one highlight uh, that they kind of need to ensure that our investment strategy approach takes into account 
responsible investment requirements, but also to try and uh, find opportunities for those beliefs and kind of policies to, to have a greater influence on how we approach our investments. Uh, as you've highlighted, there was a presentation at the last meeting and uh, it was followed up by a questionnaire to all members of the subcommittee, the board and the, and the officers as well. And uh, Ian's got a presentation which one kind of looks at the results from that review, but also looks at some of the kind of specific measures that we might want to take to inform our investment strategy uh, considerations going forward. Uh, one of the key elements that kind of touches on the, the comment or the, the question that Councillor Thompson raised in the last item uh, in terms of how we kind of build in this increased uh, consideration of climate change issues in particular, but also wider responsible investment requirements. Uh, so that is very much something that we'll be looking at in a bit more detail as part of the next stage of the investment strategy review. And as part of that, Ross is currently progressing with colleagues the development of a responsible investment belief statement which we will look to bring forward to members to inform those considerations. But uh, if I could maybe ask Ian to come in, if that's OK, just in terms of the kind of detailed analysis of that questionnaire and the recommendations associated with that. OK, thanks, Ian. Over to you then. Great, thank you. Um, so I have another presentation to share. Uh, I should note that this presentation does have 30 slides in it, but you'll be pleased to know that I will not be talking to half of them. There are a lot, we may refer to them, but I'll be focusing on, on a much smaller set of those slides. Um, so yeah, as Paul mentioned, we had a training session at the last committee meeting on responsible investment. Then a questionnaire was issued to everyone to understand, are there any strong and obvious beliefs regarding a responsible investment um, that we hold across the committee and the board? And um, if so, how we should be kind of documenting them, setting them out, and then that will help us to potentially implement them in the investment strategy and make sure we are enacting those beliefs. So this is all about that survey. What were the results? What beliefs do we think are coming out of those results? And then some questions, some potential discussion points on how we how we might implement those. So just as a quick reminder, what is responsible investment? Oh, I think this is an important thing to remember that ultimately it's about integrating a wider range of information into your investment decision making. And that particular information focuses on issues pertaining to environmental, social and governance factors and how your investments may be affecting those particular issues. It's also about the ownership of those investments that you hold, make sure you're being a responsible owner, you're engaging with the management of those companies, voting your shares to make sure that uh, those, response, those investments are being managed in a responsible manner as well. It's not necessarily about giving up return. It's not about giving up return to do good. It's not about screening out lots of nasty looking companies like tobacco or gambling companies, which which may make money. It might be if those are your beliefs, but it doesn't have to be. It's really about making sure that you are considering a wider range of information in your investment decision making and that you are being an effective and responsible owner of your assets. So why would you set investment beliefs and particularly responsible investment beliefs? So this is quite a busy slide with a bit of flow chart, but I think what I'd like to focus on are the, are the five bullet points of why you would set investment beliefs. And really it's all about setting out a document which really just tells you how you should be behaving when making investment decisions. Something that whenever a decision comes, you can refer back to, is this aligned to these key beliefs we've set? So they should be very high level, broad beliefs um, that you can easily implement in your investment uh, strategy. So there's five key reasons here of why you would set them and what, what the benefits are. So one is clarity. Beliefs show exactly to internal or external people why you might be behaving or investing as you are. So an obvious example would be you invest in Shell. An external investor might think, why do they invest in Shell if they contribute to climate change? So let's say you have a belief that you believe in engagement over divestment. That would be a clear indication to them of why you hold Shell. Priority. Um, typically in belief statements, it sets out what's most important to the fund, what you believe is most important to the fund and to yourselves. 
and so it helps that in the long list of work you always have on it helps you to priority prioritize these pieces of of work and make sure you're doing what's most important to the fund and will generate the most value consistency continuity long-term thinking are all quite similar so consistency means if you have this broad big kind of framework of beliefs um, it means it provides this framework for all future decision making to make sure that they're always consistent that none of your decisions are clashing with each other because they've all stemmed from these these beliefs um, continuity means that every decision is then kind of consistent with the last make sure that um, you are gradually working towards an investment strategy aligns to these beliefs and then long-term thinking it really helps you to focus as a long-term investor what are the big issues so from a from a general investment beliefs perspective this might be that you believe equities um, generate strong returns and whilst they may be risky as a long-term investor you can ride out these bumps to earn higher returns and so this would mean that when there's particular market volatility, if ever a question came up of, of should we be divesting from equities whilst things are bumpy, you'd say no, our belief is that we're a long-term investor and we can ride these out. So it helps you to focus your decision making here and avoid kind of knee-jerk reactions and, it, and that pertains to responsible investment beliefs as well, which is why we've gone through this, this process to try and set these and create this, this belief statement. And really, it's all about this slide that I showed you last time of what type of responsible investor you do you want to be. If you just want to meet regulatory requirements, kind of do not the bare minimum, but not really push the boat out too far, maybe you're a, you're a core responsible investor. But if you want to be a leader, you want to stand out from the crowd, you want to use responsible investment as a key driver of your investment decision making, then you'd be a leader. And this all stems from your beliefs. So if you have a belief that responsible investment is going to be an incredibly important financial impact going forward you'd probably be more likely to be a leader whereas if you think it's not going to be a huge driver of financial returns going forward you're more likely to to be a core investor and then this again drives what type of activities you would take um, when you set your investments so we do have every question and all the responses in these slides, but rather than go through them all one by one, I've picked out here the areas of consensus and what we can take from this are some potential beliefs. So I can go through these um, and then at the end we can debate them if there are any that you don't agree with or if you think I've misread the analysis of the questionnaire results then, then we can say but this really will inform what this investment responsible investment belief statement will look like. So starting with the top left, the first question was just really to understand when we're setting these beliefs, are we coming from a position of good understanding of RI and so are these beliefs kind of well founded and it's very pleasing to say that the responses were generally that you had a very good understanding of responsible investments. So that means these beliefs are coming from a really good understanding. So that's a great place to start. Going on to the beliefs though, what came out of the questionnaire was definitely an uh, a belief that sustainability was very important sustainability of investments and sustainability of returns so here we definitely have a belief that we want to make sure that our investments are sustainable that they're going to generate sustainable long-term returns as we are a long-term investor climate change was another one which is definitely linked to sustainability of um it presents not only risks in terms of things like stranded assets or being invested in companies that are going to be left behind, but also opportunities that if there's going to be a big shift to a lower carbon economy, this of course creates lots of opportunities that lots of new products and services are going to be needed in the future. So if you can invest in companies that produce those today, then, then there's big returns to potentially be met. So here we have a belief that climate change presents both risks that we need to manage but also opportunities that we could potentially exploit. There was definitely a very strong agreement that good management of ESG issues is key to long-term value. It aids performance, which is just really common sense. That's essentially saying better run companies should produce better returns for you. So this is, again, this is a very key belief that we believe ESG issues and the integration of them is important from a financial perspective. We found it very important that we collaborate with other LGPS funds on responsible investment matters. 
this is great because it means that if you collaborate with others, you get a bigger voice, more assets behind your views. Um, and then reporting is something that came out a lot and we can discuss more. Um, reporting of RI issues, how they're being implemented in your investments is very important. You need to have a good understanding of, of whether they're being managed correctly. And if when we have this belief statement that they're being managed in line with your beliefs. So we need to make sure we're getting the correct reporting from managers in particular on this. Um, you expect your investment managers to integrate responsible investments into their investment processes and decision making. And again, they should be monitored on this, so they need to report it. I think an important one here is investment objectives should be prioritised ahead of ESG outcomes. I agree with this. So what this means is that your fiduciary duty comes first and that this pension fund isn't necessarily here to um, do good regardless of the investment returns. What it means is you have a belief that you would want to integrate responsible investment and ESG in ways that at least don't damage your returns. They should either ex You should expect them to either improve your returns or at least have no impact on them, which is, is definitely sensible. Um, monitoring investment managers on voting engagement is important. Um, that's definitely correct. You you delegate the voting and engagement of the investments you hold onto your investment managers. So it's very important that you're aware of what they're doing. I used the example before of investing in Shell. Someone might ask why we do that. And our answer would be because we believe in engagement over divestment. The next question is always going to be, but what are you doing to engage with Shell to get them to change? And so you need to make sure that your managers are reporting to you what they're doing on these areas so you have a good understanding. Um, you also believe that you should make yourselves accountable for your RI activity. So that means you should report what you're doing. If you set targets, you should publish them and, and publish progress against them. And then one final one, which should have been included on this slide, was a belief in engagement over divestment, um, which is, again, very, very sensible and um, one that I personally am aligned to as well. So these are the general beliefs that I think have come out of the results, which we can debate later on if, if we think none, some of those aren't correct. But what does that mean in terms of kind of potential actions we may take further down the line? So RI integration, making sure ESG is factored into investment decision making, that's important to us from a financial perspective. We believe these companies will outperform if they have better ESG integration. So currently, ESG isn't necessarily explicitly integrated into all of the investments we make. I'm thinking a lot about our, our passively managed funds. They invest in stocks that are selected by an index provider. Um, the weights assigned to those stocks are dependent on how big that company is relative to the other companies in the index generally. And really, they don't have an input into how much you're investing in each company that's based on ESG. So if we believe that ESG will lead to outperformance, that better run companies from an ESG perspective will outperform, then do we want kind of more explicit integration of ESG into the investment decision making? And by this, I mean a factor into the weight that you invest in different companies. Part of that decision is influenced by the ESG characteristics of those particular companies. That's just one potential example we could look at here. So potentially moving some or all of the passive holdings into maybe more ESG focused versions of these of these passive funds. Climate change. So we said that, yes, it's a risk, but also it's an opportunity. Is this something we want to more explicitly be trying to exploit? Um, right now, we aren't necessarily explicitly trying to target this. So again, as I mentioned with ESG, do we want to really focus in on investments that may potentially focus on climate change? So maybe avoiding companies that are particularly bad from a carbon perspective or investing in companies that are maybe providing the solutions to climate change that will hopefully outperform in the future. And then finally reporting as well. So we want to make sure we're getting the reporting we need from our managers on things like voting and engagement. Um, 
but also we should be looking at if things like climate change are important do we want to start looking at things like carbon footprinting of our of our investments if we believe this is a big risk do we want to be getting reports to look at where are the potential climate change risks within our portfolio where are we adequately exposed to the opportunities coming from climate change which is something that can come from carbon footprint reports so then we just have a, a number of slides showing the results of the um, survey which i won't go into but thus summarize the next steps um, coming from this and then we can open up to discussion and debate so the next steps of this are to draft a responsible investment belief statement based on um, the results of the survey and, and what I've just discussed there and the debate we have now. Um, we have to contact our managers, making sure we contact them on a regular basis, engaging them on what they're doing on responsible investment. Are they implementing these beliefs of our statement? Um, continue to consider training. You're all well informed, but do we, we want to maintain this, maintain this knowledge, improve this knowledge? And if there's particular areas such as ESG or climate change investing, do we want more training on that? And then again, consider reporting. What are our managers doing, but also potentially carbon footprinting reports as well? Um, so with that, I will open up to any questions or comments. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ian. Um, so, members, it's over to yourselves. Have you got any questions? Stephen, did you want to come in on this particular one? Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I suppose my only, I mean, o often we've had advice in the past, uh, particularly around, I suppose, responsible investment that would be, um, you know, it's better to be involved with companies, uh, you know, a, a sort of voting level, whether that be, you know, for example, legal in general or whatever, um, making their feelings known uh, in terms of values at, at the company AGMs, you know, and that be, might be sort of, it's better to be in there influencing companies that need to improve rather than sort of ditching them all together because they're sort of left to, to roam free, if you like. So um, is that... Uh, However, that, that position has come un, under criticism from various quarters, you know, so what, how do you balance, what's your position on that in terms of being able to advise us as, as, a, as a pension subcommittee? So my position on that is you're absolutely right. I think it's better to be engaging with companies trying to push change than divesting. We've seen quite a lot of success on a lot of these um, companies that are bad from a climate change perspective. These big oil and gas companies like Shell have made a lot of changes to their business model because of shareholders engaging with them to change. A lot of people would say they've not gone far enough, which is fair enough, but they think they've gone a lot further than they would have done had engagement not been happening. Also, if you were to divest from a company like Shell, ultimately, what have you achieved? Um, you've essentially sold your share to someone else, and that someone else might be a less responsible investor than yourself and might not engage with Shell in the same way that legal in general do on your behalf. If you were to own, say, 1% of Shell and you sold 1%, you would not cut a Shell's oil and gas production by 1%. That would simply, they'd just be carrying on. So from that perspective, it would be engagement is better. I think where the challenge comes is you need to know that your engagement is is having an impact that they are changing and that they are changing quickly enough. And this is a financial issue for the fund, that if you are investing in a company like Shell and they aren't adapting to climate change quickly enough, then eventually they could be left behind and you could be left holding the shares of a company that there's no demand for their products in the future. So what you need to make sure is that they are changing quickly enough. And so things like carbon footprint report can really help in this regard that you can look, look at a company like Shell and look at how they have progressed over time. Are they aligned to things that are called transition pathways, which are kind of scientific based pathways that look at companies and, and are they aligned to um, a one and a half degree temperature increase in the world in their behaviour currently and also their plans. So you want to make sure that the companies you're investing in, are they changing if they need to change and are they changing quickly enough? And ultimately, if they aren't, that is when you would potentially need to consider, should we be investing in this company? Because if the engagement isn't working, then then there's no real point holding it. Stephen, you want to come up for that question? Yeah, th thanks, uh, Chair. So, okay, I mean, I, I sort of think I, I grasp that. I think 
when I'm now thinking of that in terms of the previous item and about um, moving 10% of the allocation towards income, I'm then thinking, OK, well, where are the best income assets in terms of uh, dividends? And you're, you're, I mean, you're looking at the likes of these sort of, uh, you know, BHP Billiton and, and sort of tobacco companies and you know, all the sort of traditional uh, income-based sort of in equity investments. So if that's where we're wanting to emphasise on the one hand, how do we balance that against the, the ethical strategy on the other hand? Yes, you're absolutely right. So this is this is when we set this investment strategy, when we have this set of responsible investment beliefs, this will be a key input into how we pick these new assets that we want to select. Um, so we would make sure that they are aligned to our beliefs and we wouldn't go investing in income assets if they look attractive from a short-term financial perspective, if they look terrible from a ESG perspective. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right that there's potential conflicts there and that's ones we would have to manage and that's why we want to set these responsible investment beliefs to drive our investment decision making. Thank you. And it's a balance. Sorry, Stephen, did you want to come back in there? No, it was just to thank, uh, thank him for the response. Yeah, and again, it's a balance because we as a pension uh, subcommittee, we've got to make sure that we get our funds back to you know ensure that we have enough to pay our uh, um, and members of, of the pension fund and getting closer to the 100 percent is you know the 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 best best way of doing that and we've already set that in place i think members looking at the next steps on on ian's presentation which was the four draft and ri belief statement for the fund engage with managers regarding ri on a regular basis consider requirements for regular ri training to maintain and improve knowledge training on net zero could be the focus over next 12 months uh, consider current report on whether this meets the committee needs uh, as well as receiving carbon footprint report is uh, I think an important part of, of part of the recommendations so if there are no other members can go to the recommendations then and members are asked to 2.1 note the contents of the presentation responsible investment beliefs workshop by uh, by the Hyman Robertson's uh, um, appendix and 2.2, agree that officers progress the development of a responsible investments belief statement and a draft statement to be presented for members' consideration and agreement at the next meeting of this subcommittee and board in March 2022. And of course, those four bullet points would be part of that as well. Are members happy with that? Agreed. Okay, thanks very much, members. Uh, we now move to item number seven, which is the pension funds and emerging issues update. This uh, standing agenda item provides an update to members on the current and emerging issues relevant to the pension fund. This particular report focuses on the annual review of investment manager objectives for the last calendar year, which will be reported to the Competition and Markets Authority, Authority following this meeting. Paul, have you got anything to add to the report? I think you've covered it there, Chairman. The report's a wee bit briefer than it previously been at other committees because we've kind of pulled the, the investment strategy review and the review of responsible investments into the kind of two separate reports. So there's not quite as much in this one, but I think it's that kind of focus on the, the review of the, the kind of fund manager objectives that is the kind of key element for, for today. Uh, probably, if you look at the appendix, the, the only elements that haven't got the kind of full green tick beside them at this stage are, are the two areas which are currently under review. One is that, you know, kind that the investment strategy, long term funding approach, which has got the kind of yellow triangles against it, and also that uh, updating of our develop sort of development rather of a responsible investment approach. So those are the two because they're very much uh, activities in progress at the minute uh, that are kind of highlighted there for further progress. I have to answer any questions, thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. Members, any questions or comments? I'll give a bit of time just in case there's a lapse in, in people. Okay, if there is no questions or comments, can we go to the recommendations? And members are asked to note 2.1, the update in relation to the review of the investment strategy as detailed as paragraph 3.1 to 3.2. 
2.2, the current and emerging issues that will impact on the pension fund as details in paragraph 3.3 to 3.6. Uh, 2.3, the annual review of investment manager objectives for 2021, and that these objectives will remain in place for 2022, as detailed at paragraph 3.7 to 3.9. And 2.4, that further updates on these issues will be brought to future meetings of the subcommittee and board as is required. Are we happy with those? Could I just ask a quickie, Archie, if you didn't mind, it's, it's regarding the cessation of CIC. Yeah. Is that going ahead okay and is it going to cost us? Well, uh, there, is, there is some information on that within the report itself, but are you uh, are you happy with things that are going there? Yes. Uh, the, the kind of key element that is towards cessation for CIC was that they're selling off their homes in the area that's now been fully undertaken so we're now into the process whereby it's just the kind of you know, kind of finalization of procedures to uh, take forward their actual cessation but uh, more than comfortable that the fund is fully protected uh, in terms of that cessation uh, that was uh, subject to report that was considered by the council's finance procurement transformation committee in the summer and there was a subsequent update, update to this committee just giving a kind of information on how that was being taken forward so everything's progressing as expected uh, based on those uh, previous considerations thanks that's fine thank you and jock if you've got any questions can you come in before the recommendations go forward please I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Well, they're going to uh, item number eight, which is the annual training plan and record of training update. And this is a standing item on the agenda with an update on the training plan. Can all members please provide Ross with an update where the committee and board members training has been carried out following the two live events. All members are also reminded of the requirement to complete the pensions regulator training, especially in light of the need to make investment decisions following the investment review. And members can also intimate to officers where training is requested or required um, that, that that would happen. Um, Ross, have you got anything, uh, Ross or Paul, have you got anything to add to this this uh, report? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, nothing to add to the report, just to echo what you, you said about the letting me know if they have uh, access to the recorded versions of the um, the trainer mentioned at item 3.3 and 3.5, just so that the training plan can be updated accordingly. Yeah, just 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 so you're aware, I've, I've sort of started the October one, um, so you can put that down as me starting. I'll finish that as soon as. Uh, members, any questions on on this report? If not, then we shall go to the recommendations. And we are asked to note 2.1, sorry, uh, the record of training and training plan for 2021-22. Sorry, Chair, Councillor Thompson's wanting to come in. Uh, Stephen, sorry. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, it must just be a, a technology glitch. Um, it was just, um, is there a way we can... Uh, enable time for some of the pension board members to do the, the required training. feels a wee bit like learning to drive from a driving instructor who doesn't have a driving licence, if you get what I mean. So um, is, is that something we can encourage or support? Because I appreciate people are busy and it's maybe hard to fit it in. Um, Ross? Uh, cer certainly, yeah. Um, I can uh, approach um, the members of the board that... Um, the, the require the training and we can and then in the past we have set up training sessions so it will be easy enough to kick them off again and get that um, done for the uh, board members. Okay, thank you. Right, well, Stephen. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, right. So members were asked to note two point one um, and two point two. Are we happy in those? Okay. I don't have any normal business left um, uh, and I've not been advised of any, so we'll uh, go into item number 10, which is the Local Government Scotland Act, which uh, I've asked to consider adoption of resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 50A4 and paragraph 6 of part 1 of the schedule 70 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. And then we have a, another link into another Zoom uh, um, Teams meeting for this. Are we happy to move to there? Yeah, let's go then. Okay. 